we've been talking about Project 2025 for a bit now, and there was a leak about a week ago, and I'm finally getting around to watching this because it's kind of a long video, but I want to watch this private training video that was leaked from the Heritage Foundation. The Heritage Foundation is like, you know, the right wing group that has been behind a lot of these, you know, lawsuits attacking gay marriage and attacking trans rights. And yeah, like just generally all the things that you can think of that you don't want to happen in society because it's motivated by like Christian nationalism, the Heritage Foundation is probably involved. So this is a training video that has been sent out to basically teach conservative politicians how to talk about the upcoming administration. Like if the conservatives were to win, like this is them talking about their platform, I guess. And I wanted to go ahead and watch this um, and respond and kind of get a feel for, you know, the insider's look. Because we've been looking at this mostly from the outside. Although to be fair, Project 2025 has a 900 page manifesto and we've gone over some parts of it. You can literally just go and read what they intend to do. Like how they intend to conflate transgender ideology with pornography and make pornography illegal and punishable by jail time. So like, okay, so they want to not only make porn illegal and punishable by jail time, but they also want to make trans people illegal and punishable by jail time. Great. So yeah, it's not like <laughs> they're public persona is hiding anything really but yeah we're gonna really kind of find out today what the heritage foundation is pushing to these conservatives in the background i agree it would be great if uh if their tactics this election bite them so hard that they actually force the republican party to pivot and become moderate that would be crazy like yeah this extremism stuff is not working even for republican voters for the most part so yeah Let's get in and see what this whole kerfuffle is all about. ProPublica and Documented obtained videos from the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 that are intended to train political appointees for the next conservative administration. We are publishing the videos unedited. The Heritage Foundation did not respond to requests for comment. Hi, I'm Katie Sullivan, and just a normal American woman. But to the left, that makes... <laughs> Former Acting Assistant Attorney General, Office of Justice Programs, U.S. Department of Justice. Okay, I just, I'm a normal woman. Like, what a way to start out, especially in this day and age of, you know, the prevalence of the weird on the right. Like, for them to just be like, I'm just a normal woman. It's like, okay, which to the left means, what does it mean to the left? It's me, a cisgendered ethno-imperialist birthing person with pronouns she, her. Words like that are quite- uh, Still not managing to get the grammar down. I'm cisgendered. No, you're not. You're cisgender. You're also- What is that about ethno something or other? Like that- well, Okay. Anyway. I feel like I already- There's too much to respond to already. <laughs> quite a mouthful. And it's one America needs to spit out before we choke on it. In the eyes of many in the world- this Imagery. every four year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. Only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. This great nation will endure as it has endured. And just a whole lot of America is so great imagery. Like that's all right, cool. I, it's interesting though how the Heritage Foundation seems to be against, you know, the whole concept of elections. And yet they're like in here, they're enshrining this, oh, every four years we do this miraculous thing where the where people vote and all that. Yeah, why does so much of what the right say sound so incredibly gay? It's weird. I mean, it's revealing. We'll revive and we'll prosper. Whether we go forward together with courage or turn back to policies that weakened our economy, diminished our leadership in the world, America's future will be in your hands. Sure thing, Reagan. Thanks. You let like hundreds of thousands of gay people die. Love you so much. Presidential transition project. They, oh no. Oh no. 
they used the trigger word transition. How could they? That's so woke. Hidden meanings. The monsters in the attic. Oh my god. I'm gonna need to speed this up, I think. Bethany, are your children afraid of monsters in the attic or under the bed? Yeah, they have been, but we always tell them that they do not exist. Today we have news. There are monsters in Uncle Sam's attic. It's the words, phrases, definitions that are used, which may look like one thing, but absolutely mean another. And it is scary. This is a training video, guys. This is, <laughs> this is a training video. During this training, we will identify the problem, discuss examples from our time in the federal government, as well as the five cross-cutting principles of the current administration. We will teach you how to unwind the words and phrases that have been so artfully layered into every document in the federal government. You can do this in any role at any level of seniority. This training will prepare you to make changes and fast. The left continually pivots and assaults definitions and phrases. They twist words and phrases to support subconscious acceptance of a philosophy that was rejected or is against the grain of human existence. Like, what is a woman? Perhaps the most effective tool the left wields is their ability- I love how, yeah, they're just gonna keep hammering on this transgenderism stuff. That's like the only thing that they have. Oh, it's so crazy. They just think you can define a woman however you want to. Like, all right, guys, chill out. Ability ...to engage in constant subliminal advertising through their narrative, words, and phrases. Marxism... Subliminal... Became... Uh, oh, no, she said Marxism! I paused it too early. She said Marxism. Oh, wow. I love... I also love being accused of, like, twisting society to the way that we want it to be when... Yeah, it's genuinely, this is what they are doing. They're using all these buzzwords, you know, I mean, literally calling us groomers and stuff. Are you trying to tell me that that's not propaganda buzzwords for the purpose of twisting the narrative to v to suit you? It is strange. Yeah, this training video is like indoctrinating the already indoctrinated. Yeah, Republicans go one sentence without attacking trans people. Challenge level impossible. <laughs> yeah, we're, let's make a right wing buzzword bingo game. It can't be a drinking game, though, or we will all die. ...socialism, then democratic socialism, and is now represented by the terms social justice and equity. This is perhaps the most scary of... Equity is a scary word. ...all. Katie, what brings to mind is the quote, he who controls the language rules the world. It's attributed to Joseph Stalin and other tyrants. And George Orwell stated, he who controls language controls culture. Even more, Hitler and others lived by the creed. If you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. Without doubt, it's true. Language is a powerful and often controlling tool. Career bureaucrats and the left. This is like 1984. <laughs> this is 1984 right now. Yeah, they're basically training conservatives right now to hear something other than what someone is saying. Like when someone says, we want equity, they're like, that means Marxism. Yeah, what year is it right now? Goodness. They're also using language to change culture and gain more and more authority, thereby upsetting the balance of power envisioned by our founding fathers. This, in essence, weaponized language against the American people. This training is vital to you as a political appointee. If there's one thing you take from this training, it is to know when you start your job as a political appointee, every single word, phrase, and acronym must be vetted, and you must determine what implications every word has before publishing or moving forward with any official or internal document. All right, so now that we have identified the problem, let's give the viewers a taste of what we saw in the Trump administration. Bethany and I were both part of a coordinated effort in the Trump administration focused on trying to take back hijacked language and definitions across the United States government and even at our engagements in the United Nations. You mean instead of doing something useful like, you know, fixing the economy? This is, th this is what they decided to use their time to do instead of doing something useful that actually helps people. Mitternacht and I are here to ask you to hit like on the video. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Subscribe. Click the bell if you feel like it. You don't have to, though. Feel free to check out the other links in the description because I sell merch like this cute tank top. I'm running a GoFundMe to try to move 2,000 miles across the country to a place where I have rights. And I have a Patreon. with I have a, He's smashing his face against my face. From our experiences, we will teach you how to identify the left's progressive language, scrutinize career staff compositions for dangerous language, and how to combat their manipulative efforts, ensuring clarity of definition and conservative intention. Bethany and I are going to give you some examples of what we mean by this- Yeah, reminder, they think this is normal behavior. <laughs> ...need to always ensure clarity, but in no way are we able to foresee the future and anticipate how the progressive left will continue to co-opt even more words and definitions. 
We can tell you the words and phrases being used today, but by the time you enter the administration, these examples may be obsolete. This will help you spot crucial issue areas to pay close attention to. We do not know what they will be calling men and women by the time you begin your tenure <laughs> with the administration. The left is trying to dismantle America and rebuild it in their own image by using the art. This is coming from the party of people who literally tried to undermine the election. Oh, the Democrats want to dismantle America. Like literally the Democrats are clinging to institutionalism while the Republicans are trying to destroy the institutions. Bring up the bite model. I don't know that I'm familiar with the BITE model. Do I need to Google something right now? BITE stands for Behavior, Information, Thought, and Emotional Control. It's like you're seeking to control all these different aspects of people. Oh, it's a model of how cults operate. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that seems to make sense to me in this context. Steve Hassan is the world's leading expert on cults, and he developed the BITE model to help evaluate them. Cool. Well, <laughs> at least, uh, you know, we've got some pre-existing models upon which to view this Strange, strange, strange behavior. Art of deception and words and definitions are their weapon of choice. Remember, words change culture. Bethany, with your extensive experience with both domestic and international policy issues, and in light of your role in, a lead in leadership positions at USAID, can you walk us through some examples of how the left uses words, weaponizes really, words and definitions? Uh, and if you could do that in a context of the cross-cutting issues that are identified and the mandate for leadership, uh, and, and really, as we understand, the cross-cutting issues were identified because they are the pillars of the Biden administration. And so they've been layered into virtually every document in the federal government. If you could walk us through some of those examples, I think it would be incredibly helpful. I'd be happy to, absolutely. The five topic areas for today's discussion are centered on women, children, and family, environment, human rights and border security, the gender cult, mm -hmm. and equity. The first topic, women, children, and family. I worked on international issues and very closely followed the language presented at the United Nations. Oh my God, that's a great point, Anarchic Fox. Remember when conservatives thought language was harmless when they say bigoted things, but now language is suddenly a dangerous tool that shapes the entirety of society? This is giving Nazi, pro Nazi propaganda energy. Yeah, truly. And I saw up close and personal how this indeed is true. Language is used to control culture. I'll never forget a conversation I had with the chief of staff at USAID. We are trying to provide alternative language for the highly controversial phrase comprehensive sexuality education or CSE, which at the United Nations had come to mean not just typical sex education, but instead had been morphed into teaching and normalizing sex at very early ages, even as young as preschool. And for girls who became pregnant, that abortion was a preferable method of birth control. Okay, so first of all, abortion is not birth control, duh. Um, the states that don't teach about birth control have the highest rates of teen pregnancy. And yes, yeah, you might need to teach preschoolers what sexual acts are so that they can correctly identify abuse. Yeah, we should reset a stopwatch every time they take a shot at trans people. <laughs> we would not get longer than two minutes, I don't think. But yeah, like, it's crazy the, gr the grooming that they come out with. Like, every single time they say that they're against teaching young people what sexual acts are... It's like, this is the key way that grooming happens because you're just like, shush, it's our little secret. We're just not gonna, we're just not gonna tell anybody. And then if the kid doesn't know that this is an inappropriate sexual act, that like people shouldn't be touching them in these places or whatever, then yeah, that enables abuse to go on for years and years and years. God, disgusting. Anyway. Back to the conversation with the chief of staff. He suggested several alternatives that each time I told him that, unfortunately, his recommended edit was also interpreted as CSE. Frustrated, he vented. They have literally- Yeah, also straight up saying that uh, children shouldn't be able to get abortions if they've been assaulted. Yeah, like, yeah, we should force 12 year olds to give birth and probably die in the process, apparently, according to these people. Co-opted the English language. And it was at that moment that I realized that the progressive left is controlling the language, redefining definitions, and by doing so, are ruling the world. On a positive note, despite all the I wish that we, we did succeed on that negotiation, DevEx published an article with the headline, No Mention of Reproductive Rights in Declarations Out of G7 Development Ministerial. You can read more about this in the course materials section. Now, let's talk about the word abortion. The left got very creative years ago and started using different words to make abortion sound a little less like murder. For example, sexual and reproductive health, reproductive rights, sexual and reproductive health services, reproductive health services, health services, sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, sexual it's, and reproductive. It's not that like all of these different things could actually be broader encompassing like sexual and reproductive health. That's not just abortion, dumbasses. That's also 
like preventative screening exams for cancer. That's also birth control access. It's also STI screening. Yeah, truly, I wish we ruled the world just through words. Imagine everybody gets healthcare. We just speak the magic words. Somebody co-opted Bethany's eyebrows. I was just so focused on her teeth and how she's showing them constantly and how uncomfortable that makes me, you know? Why do they always seem like creepy? It's like, I want to say creepy eldritch beings, but like in a bad way, you know? I, I am partial to some eldritch beings. Also, yeah, let's try to pretend like forcing a 12-year-old to give birth isn't a murder, like isn't a death sentence. Yeah, housing for all. Now magically housing is all free and everybody has it, right? My words, I spake it into existence. Goodness gracious. Of health and rights. All of these include abortion. For years, we knew that the terms they of They all law include abortion, sure, because abortion is part of comprehensive sexual health access that I just mentioned had been used and that they were code for the abortion. sleeves. Yeah, the sleeves the are not flattering. Career bureaucrats at state and USAID told us, oh, no, no, no. But then when I was negotiating with Canada for the G7 development ministerial, I said, well, can we just use these terms and add that does not include abortion? And their response was telling. They said, but it does include abortion. Even with that admission, I had a difficult time convincing political appointees. Well, yeah, something in Canada. But yes. Comprehensive reproductive and sexual health includes access to abortion because guess what? Sometimes people will die without abortion. It's crazy. What a concept. Getting them mad at umbrella terms is important to give Republicans cover for banning things that everyone wants. Like sexual reproductive health care bans are about taking health care away under the guise of anti-abortion stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't really be surprised by that at all. Oh, Canada apparently is not part of the G7 anyway. Interesting. Uh, but yeah. If they can get rid of all sexual and reproductive health under the guise of getting rid of abortion, then yeah, it's that whole give them an inch, take a mile thing where they're like, they do want to undermine access to birth control and gynecological exams. And if you have cancer, that's just God's will or whatever. I hate it when leftists use words that actually mean stuff. Urgh. That these terms were co-opted. Another example hits closer to home and highlights how imperative it is for political appointees to ensure definitions are correct and explicitly followed. Three days after President Trump took office on January 20th, 2017, he issued a presidential memorandum regarding the Mexico City policy. This became known as the Protecting Life and Global Health Assistance Policy, or the expanded Mexico City policy. When I arrived at USAID in June 2017, I was the first political appointee in a bureau outside the front office and the sixth political appointee in the building. Despite President Trump issuing a presidential memorandum at the very onset of his administration to immediately change course and to protect life, even months later, his guidance was ignored. I remember hearing careers refer to this policy and even seeing documents that referred to it as the global gag order. I immediately told the career staff that we do not refer to it as a global gag order, but instead appropriately as the protecting life and global health assistance policy. To some, it may seem inconsequential, but it actually was completely undermining the president and the American Omar says, actually, the Canada is part of G7. Okay, cool. Sorry. Thank you for your correction, though. American people who had elected President Trump. So opposed to this policy change, the left actually started a new organization and an international movement called She Decides, which invited NGOs and other foreign governments to join and actively promote abortion services and advocacy, essentially joining together to try to counter what the Trump administration was doing to protect life. Language matters. Bethany, it's incredible how the left is I just don't like, like, what else can you say about abortion at this point? Like, also, this is happening, like, this video is happening after Roe v. Wade has already been overturned. Like, I, I really despise this sh When they're like, it's, it's, it's like when J.K. Rowling still bitches about children and young people having access to hormone blockers or anything. Um, like, y'all already won. You can shut up now. It's now illegal for trans youth to get this medicine, even on the private healthcare, like th they're gonna start a family investigation and take your kids away if you do this stuff, you know? It's like, you've already won. You don't need to keep banging on about abortion. I only have a protected right to abortion because for all the other weirdness about Kansas, we did vote to protect the right to abortion and it's enshrined in our state constitution. But yeah, you don't need to keep talking about it. You've already won. Oh my God, shut up. Anyway. ...able to make killing children and babies a pro-movement. 
I mean, their narrative is just incredible. And yeah, like speaking of disgusting assertions of language that change the narrative and thought control, killing children and babies. Like how many times do I need to assert this? If I have a freshly fertilized zygote in one hand and a fully formed human baby in one hand, and I drop both of them at the same time, which one do you think one of these Republican women is actually gonna reach for and grab and try to save? Realistically, you know? They do understand the difference between a fetus and a human baby, but they will pretend not to so that they can twist the narrative and call us baby killers. Like you, again, and this is like a Bible organization, like a Christian organization, didn't, God like command in several instances for the Christian um, armies to like dash the infants against the pavement. Yeah, no, we weren't supposed to see this. This is for the fanatics. Yeah, even if I had a hundred zygotes in one hand and a baby in the other. Yeah, and I guess it's always worth mentioning that even if you make abortion illegal, abortions continue to happen at the same rate. It's just that more people die getting them. Yeah, what about that time that God... uh like sent a bear down to eat like 40 kids because they made fun of a dude for being bald. Which I think insisting that it's objectively not murder is a more valuable talking point than bodily autonomy. No, 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 no. Okay, I have actually completely shifted to the other direction on this because I used to be like, it's not murder, it's not a human person. But I think that that's a, I think that that's just a pointless argument. I think that in today's America, you'll win that argument much more easily if you concede. Sure, I concede that a fetus is an entire human person, right? but an entire other human person does not have the right to steal my organs and and like take up residence inside my body and kill me. I have the right to lethal self-defense. In the United States of America, the maternal mortality rate is higher than any other developed nation. I have the right to lethal self-defense. If another person is threatening my body, then I have the right to retaliate against that person. So I, th I honestly think that that's a much better argument about abortion. Like, first of all, yes, I agree that a fetus is not equivalent to a human person, but I think that I think that I'm just gonna leave that at the door. Like I'm gonna leave that on the table. And the argument that I would rather make is like, okay, sure. Let me just agree for the sake of the argument that a fetus is equivalent to a whole human person. I have the right to kill someone who is threatening my life. Like point blank period. Yeah, yeah, and also the Bible literally has like an abortion potion that it uh, teaches you how to make in order to determine if a wife has been committing infidelities. Yes, abortion is protected by the second amendment. <laughs> oh gosh. Also offhand, I can remember four times that God directly commanded killing babies. True, yep. Okay, let's continue. So opposite of what the reality of the situation is. We see that also with, uh, with environment, right? So I remember oh, when no. I was in school, um, in uh, elementary school, we were taught that we were all gonna be frozen over by an ice age. And of course this was terrifying. And then in the eighties, it was acid rain. We were all gonna die from the acid rain. And then it moved to global- I mean, rainwater is not safe to drink anywhere on the planet anymore, actually. Which I think, you know, most of the people watching this table remember that wasn't, that was during the Obama administration. Yes. And then science comes along and disproves the global warming theory in large part. And we have one of the most frigid winters ever known. And then the next thing you know, they're calling it climate change. Now, I always understood that climate change meant seasons. Our climate does change all the time. But of course, my feel when I can't tell the difference between weather and climate. Uh -huh. Classic. This is classic. We're running through. We're really running through the classics here. Of course, that's not what's meant by the left. What do you think about all of uh, about the left's words and definitions in 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 the environment? A great point, Katie. They don't stop. Climate change allegedly is everywhere. And if the American people elect, I feel when I understand what the word climate means. <laughs> conservative president, his administration will have to eradicate climate change references from absolutely everywhere. And according to our intelligence community, the number one threat facing our country today is drumroll: climate change. Not Russia. Not China. Not AI. Climate change. This shows how the federal government is all in on this issue. And climate change activists wield a lot of power. This is an issue to pay attention to as it- No, we don't. <laughs> climate change activists don't have any power. That's why it's not going to stop at all. Has infiltrated every part of the federal government. Now, when I think of climate change, I immediately think of population control, don't you? I think about the people who don't want you to have children because of the impact on the environment. Perhaps not everyone will make that connection, but after spending time- That's so strange. Yeah, them feigning confusion is very funny. And yeah, them, like, okay, the very first thing I think of when I hear climate change is population control. Like, all right. 
uh i'm i'm pretty adhd but even that takes a few more leaps than i'm easily capable of identifying could they not find a spokesperson that looks less like the grim reaper oh no ah. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah she kind of does Kind of does look like the Grim Reaper. The climate change is just seasons argument is weird because climate change is really messing up the seasons. Yeah. Like, remember when we used to have autumn in Kansas? Now we just go straight from summer into winter and it sucks balls. And summer is just longer and longer. And like winter and autumn and spring are all shorter and they suck now. Not beating the weirdo accusations. Oh my goodness. Time in the international space trying to protect life. I can tell you that this is part of their ultimate goal to control people. Let me share a personal example of how the left seeks to permeate every dimension of life through their skewed terminology and definition. When I arrived at USAID, I had a career employee ask me how many children I had. I thought it was a bit odd of a question, but to be kind, I answered and I said, I had three children. And he actually said to me, oh wow, one and a half too many for the environment. I smiled and I said very politely, if I could have 10 more children, I would. The policy book captures the essence of climate change. And I quote, in the name of combating climate change, policies have been used to create an artificial energy scarcity that will require trillions of dollars in new investment, supported with taxpayer subsidies to address a problem that government and special interests themselves have created. Page 364, end of quote. Population growth, environmental changes, and weather patterns have all been intertwined by the left. They take or even make up a term and create, extend, and alter the definition to validate whatever ideology or position they want to ingrain and convince others is good, when in reality it's not. Often, as you just heard, they are simply not coherent or logical. Remember, our intelligence community identified climate change. Just because you're stupid doesn't mean that it's incoherent or illogical. <laughs> oh no as the number one threat to America. So even if you do not work at the Department of Energy, no matter where you work, because of the Biden administration's executive orders and policy priorities, you will have to look for climate change language and get rid of it. Bethany, when you were talking about how the left has co-opted so many words and weaponized so many words when it comes to abortion, and that's something that you know, political appointees in the next administration are gonna have to really look at, this idea that it's a right, that there's many phrases that included rights. Uh, is there other places where rights are used as a catch-all and they actually, it means something else? Katie, that's a great question. And in fact, number three, it's human rights. Human rights and border security. So rights, rights, rights. The left is always coming up with new rights. In the Trump administration, we countered human rights with unalienable rights. The careers went absolutely crazy at USAID. But thankfully, President Trump had established a commission on unalienable rights at the State Department. And we would just point back to- She's also not even saying that word right. It's inalienable, not unalienable. Just little nitpicks. I mean, if we're if we're picking nits, then, you know. The commission. Sadly, our founding documents were not sufficient, but thankfully the commission was. The Department of State's Commission on Unalienable Rights was charged with providing the U.S. government with advice on human rights grounded in our nation's founding principles and the principles of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, I'm going to turn over border security to you, Katie, as it deals with legalese. And we all know that border security is a major issue and the differences between a conservative presidency and administration and the current administration couldn't be more stark than in this area. So Except didn't Biden continue the policies of children's separation? Like, I'm pretty sure that Biden is not great on border, but they're just gonna lie. She said unalienable. <laughs> unalienable. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, them saying that you need to scrub the words climate change or any climate related language from policies as part of your job. Yeah, I guess that's one thing that I'll, I'll grant Biden is that Biden has at least tried to put some climate change initiatives in place. Yeah, Biden continued every border policy and added more. Also, yeah, you have to like literally be in the country in order to apply for asylum. That's how it works. You have to enter the country and then start the asylum process. Biden sent more funding to border control, border patrol. Yeah. Also, yes, agree. Thank you, Max. I feel like this never gets brought up. The Ninth Amendment specifically says just because a right hasn't been enumerated in the Constitution doesn't mean you don't have the right. They knew that they weren't going to be able to cover all the basis, all the bases when it was written. So anytime you don't have an, a right that's explicitly enumerated, you could just invoke the Ninth Amendment. Like, okay, well, just because the founding fathers didn't think of it doesn't mean that I don't have the right. Unless there is a specific motivated reason to say that I don't have the right, then I should have the right. 
the painfully obviously scripted questions that make this sound con conversational. Yeah. Climate change causally affecting birth rates. I've, IDK, if I've seen a paper like that, that exactly, but if that's true, it's due to factors exogenous to the population. She was basically trying to say that there are people going, oh, you know, if you have a lot of children, then there's a ripple effect of your, and, and we were talking about it before the, before the segment started, but your carbon footprint, you know, like the best thing you can do for your carbon footprint is to kill yourself because, you know, your existence has an impact on the environment. So if you have a lot of children that has a negative impact on the environment. And so I guess like, according to her very real story, everybody clapped. She was being questioned by somebody who was like, wow, you have too many children to be good for the climate. Um, which like, you know, it's fine. It should balance out. There's so many people not having children that you would hypothetically think that it would balance out. The Ninth, ninth Amendment was actually put in because some people were opposed to the Bill of Rights because they were concerned it would mean only these rights exist. That is a worthy concern. Like the way that the Republicans are taking things now, it does seem like unless something is explicitly enumerated, they're just gonna act like you don't have rights. That story sounded like more, more like she didn't take a joke than anything. Yeah, fair enough. So getting the words very precise and correct is crucial. The left has co-opted language and definitions as it relates to immigration. Illegal immigration is one of the most devastating challenges America faces today, particularly when you factor in all of the secondary costs and effects of illegal immigration. Actually, all forms of immigration help the economy. <laughs> including illicit drug and human trafficking. The left knows the American people oppose illegal immigration and understands its effects. So they have spent years using language designed to both conflate uh, the illegal immigration. Hold on. Jonathan in the YouTube chat eh, in the YouTube chat says, I saw in a video yesterday that the world population will peak at 2100, year 2100, and developing nations are having enough children to keep the pace slash replacement rate. That's actually not the case um, because there are going to be water and food shortages in the next 50 years that will severely negatively impact the population. So, you know, if we were assuming that we weren't about to have global food and water shortages, then I could see the population would peak at 2100, but no. Like, in fact, by the year 2100, we might see population as low as 2 billion if things continue on this worst case scenario trajectory, which we are still on. But yeah, but, and yeah, it's the, the limits to growth report is what I invoke there, by the way. Like 50 years ago, there were a set of predictive economic models and we are on track for the worst case scenario model. And if things don't change, like completely U-turn in the next five years, this is just kind of the inevitable trajectory that we're on with like wildfires, floods, um, droughts, you know, just, uh, we're going to lose huge swaths of farmland and we're going to experience freshwater shortages and yeah, populations are going to dramatically be impacted. When we hit record breaking temperatures, the scientists are spreading a grand conspiracy and they get to just hand wave that. But yeah, they'll be like, whatever, it's been hot before. You ain't never had a hot summer. My cat is still snoring so loud. He's very cute. And legal immigration, the latter of which most Americans support and soften the idea that illegal immigration is, in fact, illegal. It is a good bet that the left has focused group tested in- Most illegal immigrants who are in this country came here legally and then their paperwork expired. <laughs> like, so border security isn't gonna impact that at all. Most immigrants come here through an airplane and then they come in and they just, ex they just stay past their green card. And group tested the language it uses to cover up the horrors of illegal immigration. For example, when describing illegal immigration, the left likes to use words and phrases like undocumented immigrants and migrants. These terms are, des are designed to sound softer and take the edge off the fact that these people are illegally in the United States. It is important to note- But the thing is that those people are not illegal themselves, so calling them illegal immigrants is implying that their existence is illegal. Yeah, asylum is protected under inter international law. I love breaking international law, though that they specifically avoid using the word alien, which is the terminology used in federal law. To be clear, alien is not a negative or pejorative term. It is a legal term of art. It simply means that an individual is not a citizen of a particular country. Language matters here for a lot of reasons, but primarily because citizens of the United States have rights that others, including foreign nationals who are illegally on our soil, do not. If I had to guess, I would say that the left's attempt to wash away the- I mean, you still have rights, like, it, like being a citizen is not the only p type of person who has rights, but okay. 
term alien stems from their disdain of actual law, since they want to avoid discussion of what federal immigration law actually requires, which is everything they refuse to do, and their interest <laughs> in washing away the overall value of citizenship. Remember, citizenship- The teleprompter is so far off to the right of the camera is part of what's bothering me about her. And also she's not very good at reading off the teleprompter as though it's natural. I think this is part of what makes this feel so stilted. It's like her gaze is so far away from the camera. A lot of the time, like, I think most of the time nowadays, you put the teleprompter very, very close to the camera. A lot of local products went up in cost after Arizona passed a law requiring proof of, of ability to work. It was a mess. And every employer I had after that complained about missing them. Yeah, I mean, there it, it's um, immigrants, undocumented immigrants are an exploitable labor class for sure. It places a focus on nationality and sovereignty. The left has bought into the globalist vision of a borderless world and their language choices reflect that. The left loves to say- I wish that Democrats wanted a borderless world. You know, you ever see that meme is like, nobody here is calling for, for no borders. And then it's like, I'm calling for no borders. The illegal aliens are undocumented. Not only is that terminology not used anywhere in federal law, but it is clearly designed to soften the concept of illegality by making it seem like it's just a technicality. And yeah, I mean, because illegal aliens is dehumanizing language is, is part of the problem, too. It's like you can justify doing anything really messed up to somebody if they're non-human. In other words, if you are undocumented, it makes it sound like you can be here legally, but you're missing a few pieces of bureaucratic paperwork. That That's is literally, yeah. That's like there's a process by which they could be here legally and they're just missing that. Pay yeah, that's literally it. Especially because, again, most illegal immigrants who are in this country, quote unquote, are are here because their paperwork expired and they just didn't like renew their stuff. Like it's like their green card has expired. Yeah, people moving from one place to another, the horror. Again, ignoring the fact that this like benefits the economy on almost every metric. It's simply not the case. If an alien has not gone through the appropriate process for obtaining a visa to enter the United States or otherwise followed United States law to enter the United States, they are illegally here. Period. Hard stop. Calling illegal aliens undocumented immigrants is the intellectual equivalent of calling someone who breaks into your house in the middle of the night an undocumented homeowner. It is inaccurate and it is designed to be inaccurate. The term migrants or my I don't have anything to say. I just need a moment of silence for that stupidity. As an ex-military linguist, I can tell you they are using prescriptive language and not descriptive. It's backwards and unevolutionary. If you want to speak a dead language, choose Latin. Don't kill my English. Yeah, fair enough, Zipation. Migration are just as deceptive. The left likes to use migrants and migration, not only because it sounds gentle, but it also creates confusion. When people hear these terms, they know deep down that migration is seasonal and circular. They think of birds or butterflies. They fly south, they fly north, and so on. And historically, we have had foreign nationals come into the United States for seasonal or agricultural work and then return to their home countries. It would be reasonable and accurate to refer to those individuals as migrant workers because they ultimately return home. But make no mistake. The current mass illegal immigration we are seeing as a result of the Biden administration. Why is that preferable if those those people like come into the United States to work and then they don't pay any taxes here? Why would that be preferable? It's because she wants to continue to profit off of brown people's labor to do work that white people don't want to do, like farming. Intentional actions is not migration. And these people are not migrants. It is an Ooh, it is a pretty telling analogy because she thinks white Christian citizens, quote, own America. Ooh, that's a good point orchestrated invasion being led by the Biden administration okay. in conjunction with the Mexican cartels. The bottom line is we win or lose political fights based on language. If you let the- What are any of you politicians going to do without the drug cartels, given all the cocaine you guys do all the time? Like seriously, this type of lady is the type of lady that does cocaine. I'm not saying she does it, but like people in fast paced, high level jobs, especially like corporate or office or like that, like lawyers and stuff, they do a lot of cocaine. What are you going to do without the Mexican drug cartels? Other side of the debate, set the terms of the debate, you've already lost. In the context of immigration specifically, we have to start using more accurate language to describe what is going on and pegging so our They'd language have to get it from the CIA, true. ...to existing law. If we can take back the language here and elsewhere, we will win more of these fights.
So Bethany, I mean, these are some great examples. And another one that comes to my mind that has been completely co-opted by the left um, is gender. And oh, I, mean, here we go. I know you have so much experience uh, in, in the history of your professional life in dealing with this. Where are we today on this issue and the language and the, and the words and the definitions? Let's talk about the word gender. The word gender is no longer a polite way to refer to biological sex, male or female. The word now is completely toxic. It's no longer being used to mean male or female, but now how people identify, which is where we get this idea of gender identity. Katie, did you know that there are between 72 and a yeah, I guess like a butch woman isn't really a woman because she has all these male features, but she only identifies as a woman. Like, what? God, God, I hate these people so much. Oh yeah, true. I guess it's fair. Yeah, it's not that white people literally won't do the farming jobs. It's that corporations will not pay owners enough so they would prefer migrant labor. Right, yeah. They can just, it, again, because, because immigrants are an exploitable labor class that you don't have to pay them minimum wage because they're not protected. Like, you can just... Be like, well, if you don't like what I'm paying you, then why don't I call the feds about the fact that you're here without documentation? Anyway, yes, trans people. Thousand different kinds of gender. We should never use the word gender as conservatives. It's not specific and it's nonsensical. Instead, use the word sex or biological sex or male and female. And I don't care where you are in the administration, you will deal with the word gender. Speaking of sex, the next phrase that we're going to talk about is- I mean, like, show of hands, does it not say gender on your birth certificate? I think it says gender on your birth certificate. Or does it say sex? I don't know. We, we've used these terms interchangeably for such a long time that uh, oftentimes in documentation, gender does mean sex. I'm sure someone could call these women females in a tone that they would find offensive. <laughs> sex assigned at birth. Now, I just told you to use the word sex, and you may think that sex assigned at birth, that sounds great. Well, actually, it's not. It's the left's attempt to change biological fact and to try to normalize their belief that biological sex can change. Unfortunately, many folks, including solid conservatives, have accepted this and don't understand the danger in using this term. Also, it's also worth, it's always worth mentioning that sex assigned at birth is not only a useful concept for trans people, but also a useful concept for intersex people because every single time they they make a law saying you can't give children gender affirming care, they carve out exceptions for forcibly altering the genitals of babies who are born intersex. So they do want to be able to forcibly assign gender at birth. Yeah, they've just eradicated gender on accident. Gem gender abolitionists. No, this is the bad kind of gender abolition. In fact, some conservatives have even taken this term and changed it slightly, gender as revealed at birth. The left is infiltrating our conservative organizations, Christian schools, and even churches. We must always be on guard. And when a new term is introduced, ask, what is the genesis for this new term? And why was it introduced? If you see the term sex assigned at birth, delete it and replace it with biological sex. The next issue under gender is pronouns. Don't fall into the progressive left's trap in regard to pronouns. Don't use them in email signature blocks, on LinkedIn, and absolutely do not ask people what their pronouns are on your first day on the job. When I was at US- It's gonna be so difficult for them to have normal human conversations if they're avoiding pronouns, but they don't ever mean that, of course. Like, like pronouns is just like their indirect way of saying trans people. ID. Managers were giving training and were told that when they have new staff or have a staff meeting, they should go around the room and ask everyone what their pronouns are. Katie, if that happened to you, what would you do? I think political appointees, Bethany, great question, uh, need to expect that they are going to be tested by career staff the day they walk in. So that question, every political appointee should be prepared to deal with and answer, whether it's in a training. I don't think it'll take that long. It probably will be the first couple days on the job. So a political appointee is empowered. They are empowered because they are absolutely put in the position, whatever level it is, in order to, uh, in order to implement the president's agenda. And that is the business of a political appointee and should be the business of all federal employees. So the answer is simple. We're here to implement the president's priorities and agenda. We are not here to discuss pronouns. The next topic is gender affirming. Just avoid the question. I think it was her advice at the end of that. Care. Gender affirming care and what the Biden administration is promoting is absolutely infuriating, especially as for parents. We need to be protecting our children from these harmful, sterilizing puberty blockers, cross sex hormones, and permanent genital mutilation. That puberty pausing medication doesn't cause infertility. Why? Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> If I took a shot every time they said the left I'd have died of alcohol poisoning 20 minutes ago. True. How to never make friends and make your boss hate you 101. Fair enough. That's what gender affirming care is. Not care at all. The idea that gender is fluid is evil. And it is a major it's initiative. It's evil. Ooh, we have our first evil mention. Abortion isn't evil. 
But gender affirming care is fascinating. The Biden administration. It's layered into each and every office, document, task force, and funding priority. Perhaps most commonly known are the changes to Title IX giving institutions, schools, control over children and their gender preference, working against parents, mandating boys compete against girls. This is all done with words. Words matter. Change the words, change the culture. Now, Katie, I know that you've written several wonderful pieces on equity and you've done a lot of research on this. And wow, that was a surprisingly Ooh. brief thing if they're just moving to equity now. Does she think that other administrations sit around debating gender pronouns? If so, how many hours a week does she think, does she estimate it consumes? Yeah, for her, for her to be like, well, listen, we have more important things to talk about than pronouns. Oh, you mean like, what else is on the docket that's going to take as little time as it would take for you to introduce yourself? Yeah, we need to care about objective truth, like things being evil. Goodness. I feel like my IQ is dropping <laughs> just as I sit here. The Biden administration has infiltrated equity into everything. What are your thoughts on equity for the next administration? Well, it's a little heart stopping, Bethany, and it's going to take a lot to rewind uh, where we are right now with this, um, with the left's definition of equity and how that's layered into all federal government documents. Roger Severino states it perfectly in the Project 2025 Mandate for Leadership book. Quote, under President Biden, the mission has shifted from promoting equity in everything we do, end quote, for the sake of, quote, populations sharing a particular characteristic, including race, sexuality, gender identification, ethnicity, and a host of other categories. End quote. Equity no longer means all men are created equal, the cornerstone of our U.S. Constitution, but rather now mandates the government to dispense with unequal treatment in order to achieve what they believe to be equal outcomes. This creates divisiveness, not equality. There is no unification under these principles. It is more of a competition of what class is more of a victim, so that particular class can receive the preferential treatment being handed out and mandated by the Biden administration. Well, we believe that only white people should receive preferential treatment. So if anybody else starts receiving preferential treatment, that's a bad thing. Administration. It's important to note that the very first executive order that President Biden uh, signed just moments after his inauguration on January 20th of 2021 had to do with equity. The left applauded as Biden announced his number one priority, which is advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities throughout the federal government. As part I mean, yeah, I don't like, aren't like black people are like 13 to 15% of the total population. And we do not see black people being 13 to 15% of representation in the government. That's what equity would mean. They're so mad they're trying to make DEI into a slur. I mean, functionally, yeah, when they say like Kamala is the DEI hire, it's their way of like saying the N-word without saying the N-word. I bet these people needed to explain to them why track runners have staggered starting lines. <laughs> oh, don't, don't challenge their poor little tiny worlds, okay? They don't, they don't understand, okay? Part of that executive order, within 90 days, every single agency had to file an equity action plan with the White House. If you want to see or view- Oh yeah, also 51 to 52% of the population is female at all times, and we don't see that level of representation at the federal government for sure. Are we even at 30% females? What you will be up against. Take a look at those plans. They're all online under the Office of Management and Budget. Since that time, nine more executive orders have been executed by the Biden administration about equity. The latest to date is to further advance racial equity. This entails new positions and responsibilities to be embedded into every single agency and office in the federal government. And there is also a directive that all funding that is given out by the federal government prioritize unequal treatment of the American people. The noxious tenets of critical race theory and mm -hmm. gender ideology should be excised from curriculum in every single public school in this country. So Katie, this is a lot to absorb. So how do you suggest that we tackle the problem? I know you were the head of a grant office at DOJ and you had a lot of paperwork. What are your suggestions? Well, I found that developing a process for each type of document was crucial to reversing the words and definitions from the Obama administration. Here's an overall strategy to implement. First, look for any OMB, that's the Office of Management and Budget, White House Office of Management and Budget, guidance. You'll want to instruct career employees that you, whatever level you are, you want to be informed of all OMB guidance and how it is being implemented internally. 
oftentimes careers will just get an OMB circular or an OMB advice, and then they just go along and they either ignore it or they don't put it in. You want to be involved in the process. You want to say, every single thing that comes in, I want to make sure that it is actually being implemented. This can easily be handled at the senior advisor or even special assistant level. The second thing you need to do, and quickly, are look at guidance documents. Now, I've talked about this in other trainings. Guidance documents are simply a federal career employee's uh, interpretation of, of a statute, of an appropriation given by Congress, of a rule or regulation, and how it's going to be implemented. A guidance document is not binding. It is simply, in some ways, just their opinion. The problem with a guidance document is, is that it has a tremendous amount of authority. Because if you are looking to, to an agency to find out what they're looking for for your grant or how your grant program will be implemented or what rules they have around it. You're going to look at those guidance documents. They end up with a tremendous amount of authority. It really ends up being the career's agenda being uh, forced onto the American people. A court is the only uh, real institution that can give us a definitive interpretation of any kind of uh, grant program, appropriation, or rule. So most likely, you will the Office of Management and Budget will come out very quickly with a plan to take down all the guidance documents that are currently up that reflect uh, the Biden administration's agenda. Uh, so you'll first want to notice how they spent this whole time attacking quote careers, the people who aren't political appointees and have spent their lives learning how to actually do the job well and keep the government functioning. Yeah, that is good. That's a good point. I kind of was like not sure what they meant by careers. I'm like, are you like people who've been in the job for longer? But yeah, I, I, I'm guessing that she means like employees of the various agencies who mostly are the same across, you know, from one administration to another. Yeah, we're still at like 27, 28% of, of women in the national legislature. Imagine having people in place who actually know how to do their job and keep the government functional. Wouldn't that be crazy? But no, we're doing everything we can to undermine those agencies. The free market is dead and Biden killed it. True. Look at that process. How to identify and replace misguiding language. A guidance document is not binding. OMB can and should come out with a plan to take down all guidance documents that reflect the Biden administration agenda. Fun. The second thing you're going to want to do, sort of the second layer, is to absolutely uh, look at things that may not appear to be guidance documents, but are. For instance, one of the documents on our website uh, was supposedly done by a Rutgers, you know, professor. And it, so it looked like it wasn't actually career guidance. But when you really dug into the document, it was not part of any kind of grant program. And it really was just a career who asked a whole bunch of questions and a Rutgers uh, professor said yes. So it really, in the end, was a guidance document and we brought it down. Another really frightening example when um, I was running the Office on Violence Against Women was a provision in the Violence Against Women Act that about gender identity. And if you identified as a woman and you showed up at a woman's domestic violence shelter, uh, you had to be accommodated. Um, there were lawsuits, of God course, forbid. about this as predators used that in order to gain entry into a place where there were vulnerable women. Never has that happened ever. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna state it. If she can state that predators were using this to get in to women's shelters, I'm just gonna state that that has never happened ever seemed to me to be exactly opposite of, you know, the intention, yeah, the intention of the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, in any event, the, it was directed toward just the um, Office on Violence Against Women programs. It was in the Violence Against Women Act. But in the Obama administration, the entire grant making component of the Office of Justice programs, which I later went on to run, the head of that office actually wrote a guidance document that said that the provision in the Violence Against Women Act regarding to gender identity was, was intended to apply to every single DOJ grant program, that it wasn't limited to the Office on Violence Against Women. There was absolutely no indication that this was true. Oh, but you no. can see that just by getting that particular uh, uh, legislation passed and the way that the careers then interpreted it, created a complete change in culture across the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. The next step will be to read every single executive order. I would suggest that, you know, starting with an assistant, a special assistant, a senior advisor, that you get every single executive order and put it in a binder and have that binder for the principal and make sure that it's flagged for them. There will be a lot of executive orders that come out and some of them actually and no Basically, they just said, oh, if we get Trump into office, then he's going to start immediately issuing a ton of executive uh, orders like this is this is all guidance for Republican candidates, assuming that they are going to get a Republican in the presidential seat. So they're just saying like, yeah, we expect there to be a ton of executive orders as soon as Trump gets in.
dismiss, repeal other executive orders. So you need to then pull the executive orders that are being repealed so you are very clear about what needs to be redacted. Now let's go back to that OMB tip that I gave. And just like that, you need to be part of the process that the careers are using to implement executive orders. During the Trump administration, I can tell you that executive orders were, were signed, fully executed, uh, where all the guidance was given. You gave an example of this, Bethany, uh, to our office. And I later found out that it was just simply ignored. It, it, it's not worth you know, the, the price of the paper it's written on if your careers are not implementing what the president wanted. I think you can expect that equity and all of the equity uh, executive orders under Biden will be repealed early in the next administration. This is going to require a very detailed plan to execute the eradication of the dictates in the equity orders. For instance, there's a gender advisor position created by one of these executive orders. That position has to be eradicated, as well as all the task forces, the removal of all the um, equity plans from all the websites, and a complete rework of the language in internal and external policy documents and grant applications. Which leads me to grants and rules and regulations. Well, grant- This is part of why, honestly, I think that the system as we have it is so stupid. The idea that the new administration can come in and just basically unravel all of the advancements that have been made in the previous administration. Like, I'm not saying that I have an idea of what system would work better, but if Trump can come in and just immediately dismantle like everything in the government that has to do with equity and like we can just erase the term climate change from all of these documentations and everything like Maybe it would feel less insane if the two parties weren't so dramatically different to each other. But it seems like it has always been the case from like from my perspective that, you know, Democrats come in and they fix things like uh, like a tax plan. And some of those things don't really come to full fruition until after that that Democrat leaves office. And then the Republican in the office is like gaining all of the um the good reputation for like oh my the taxes went down under the republican and then the republican passes a tax law that f over the middle class and then that doesn't really fully go into effect and start being seen by people as having an impact on their lives until the democrat comes back in and then they blame the democrat for how bad their taxes are and like this this is the problem with executive orders and how much power has been given to the executive branch right and it's like <sighs> I can complain about how much power there is in the executive branch, but I also kind of understand when you're dealing with this bureaucratic nonsense with the filibuster and all this and all this gerrymandering making it impossible to get a true majority in the Congress that executive power sometimes is the only way to get anything done. Conservatives will claim that wokeness is like 1984, but redacting things is literally what Winston Smith's job was in 1984. Yeah. Yeah, his whole job was to delete all references to certain things. That's funny. Yeah, Byron says, reminder that Trump's tax cuts for the middle class. Uh, was it tax cut? Oh, his tax cut for the middle class was written to then raise taxes starting after his first term was up. Yeah, my taxes, um, my tax situation has started to really suck balls in the last few years. Like, I make just enough money to not qualify for the, um, for some of the credits that you get as a lower income person. It's fucking really frustrating, actually. I hate ages you like Palpatine. True. Oh, goodness. We only have like nine minutes left. And grant programs are funded with your federal tax dollars and they are appropriated by Congress. So you get, you are told how much money you have for what particular program. And typically your appropriations language will just give a very brief description of the program. And that's the direction that Congress has given the agency. Every single grant has conditions. You want to think of this like a carrot and a stick. You can have your federal money in order to support uh, your program, but only if you agree uh, to certain conditions, which are built into the grants. When I began at the Office on Violence Against Women, our grant applications were 75 to 110 pages long pages and pages of guidance that had no statutory or congressional counterpart and tons of conditions, the conditions that you would need in order to receive the money. And you would need to continue to live with those conditions throughout the time of your grant. I mean, that's how it works. Like the, I mean, honestly, the executive branch is gigantic because all of these agencies fall under the jurisdiction of the executive. And yeah, like, oh, you're complaining there's pages and pages of guidance. That's your whole job. 
Why don't you get like five different people and assign them each 20 pages? It'll be easier to get through. American politics are so dirty, the hospital superbugs wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. Goodness. For instance, to receive grant uh, money, certain programs would have to show a partnership with an LGBTQ support group. There was no language in the appropriation for that grant that an LGBTQ subgrantee was mandated. The career said it was best practices and it was an Obama pr uh, administration priority. This condition on many grants funded a lot of LGBTQ organizations. So we removed that language and we removed those conditions as we wrote the grants moving forward. Because screw LGBTQ kids, I guess. Rules and regulations also need ultimate political sign-off and a tremendous amount of political involvement. Your careers may draft initial, you know, the initial documents, the rules and regulations, but there should be multiple political edit edits on the final proposed, any final proposed rule or regulation. The left is excellent about holding up process. So you wanna expect and prepare for thousands of comments coming from tons of left supported groups on any rule that you put up. So expect that and have a- Oh, so you mean like the public public comment like the people that you're supposed to be representing are you saying that there's going to be a lot of public comment on all these proposed changes that you want to make oh that's going to be so annoying isn't it you a politician who is supposed to represent the people i bet that's so annoying when the people tell you what they want you to do wow plan to deal with those thousands tens of thousands of comments in order to move the president's agenda, if you are prepared to deal with the comments that are coming in, then you aren't going to let them delay the rule because they have to. They're basically, yeah, just saying like, we're going to run roughshod over what the people actually want in this allegedly democratic country because we're going to shove through the president's executive orders. Be responded to each one of the comments. Wow. The careers will want to follow the system that's currently in place for handling comments or conditions or how grants are written. You are empowered as a political appointee to adjust these processes as long as you are meeting all legal requirements. So you may have to deal with pushback, but really look at your process and change it. Okay. Change the process so that you don't have to listen to public comment anymore. Sounds great. A tip here. In addition to the sheer volume of guidance and conditions to grants and explanations of uh, proposed rules, is to ask careers to explain a grant program or the need for a rule in two sentences. It is astonishing how difficult it is for a career who works in the policy or grant space to actually accomplish this. And finally, use your common sense. Even if you see something that isn't directly addressed by an executive order or an OMB circular or directed by your agency head, you wanna use your common sense to redact the words and definitions which are weakening our nation as we have discussed, certain words and phrases used together have hidden definitions. Mm -hmm. A really good example is social emotional learning. That's actually the new buzzword for CRT or critical race theory. Okay. Here's a tip. When you see phrases, any phrase like this, one that sounds innocuous, ask your careers to identify the origin of that phrase. Where did it come from? Why are you using that phrase particularly? What does it mean based on the original intent of those words? And then... I would highly recommend you start your own research. As a last note, plan to read a lot of documents. Know how your careers are implementing the president's executive orders, OMB directives, and be very involved in that process. I can't stress enough the need to control all documents. Create a system where nothing goes out, nothing is published, nothing is put on your website without review by a delegated- We love how they keep saying, oh, the, liberal, the liberals, the leftists want to control everything. And then, then they're like, it's because we need to control everything. Like, yeah, all right, we get it. Political or the principle of any office. Ask lots of questions and do not make assumptions. And finally, if a career employee rushes in and says it is an emergency, and I think a lot of people who are an assistant, chief of staff, um, maybe senior advisor or special assistants are going to have careers just descending on them, talking about how it's an emergency that the principal sign something. That's a red flag. Right away, it's a red flag. By the time you get into your position, you will realize that the government moves very, very slowly. Just think about your clearance process and how long that took. These documents need to be read even more carefully. If a career thinks they can push you to sign something by giving it to you at the very last minute, that will become the norm and it will hinder your ability to actually go through a process, read things. This is just dressed up tinfoil hat nonsense, except it's from a major policy contributor to one of the most po powerful political parties on the planet. Yeah, it's quite strange that they're like so conspiracy minded, but also like this is, you know, 
going to actually have a serious impact on political appointees going forward. Like, even if Trump doesn't get in office, there are still going to be a bunch of people who watched this training video who do get appointed, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, who are going to, you know, basically be, they're going to do the opposite. Right now, like, this guidance is like, pay attention to every executive order, make sure that they're actually executing on those things. But if Harris gets in, they're going to bureaucratically slow down everything. They're just going to not enforce those executive orders. Kind of crazy, actually. Why does the woman in the blue dress look familiar? I am not sure. I don't know that I've seen her before. I mean, I mean, she looks like the Grim Reaper. Have you had any near-death experiences? Edit things and make sure that they are completely in line with the president's priorities and agenda. The president's agenda will be in peril from your office if you allow this emergency uh, kind of process. Katie, that was great. Thank you for taking us through that process. Do you see? The monster is in the attic and it is layered in virtually every document monster. in the federal government. Grant applications, rules, regulations, internal and external policy documents, guidance documents, tweets, speeches, and panels. Every one of these phrases or words that are not corrected by being redacted or rephrased is a failure of the presidency. As the Heritage Foundation's president, Dr. Kevin Roberts, boldly and courageously states in the mandate for leadership, the next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitive, abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, regulations, and piece of legislation that exists. And the next conservative president will only be able to do so with your help. Are you up for this challenge? We think you are. Together, let's conquer the monsters in Uncle Sam's attic. That's insane. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just need a minute, okay? I think that page that she was just reading from, I think that's the page right before um, the part of the manifesto where they say that they're going to make porn illegal. Like, I'm pretty sure it's right there next to it. Yeah, we're just gonna censor and delete everything we dislike. Yeah, this is wild. Like, it's just, what do, at a certain point, what do you even say? Like, I, I had to respond to so many things in that, even though I was trying to rest my voice as much as possible. Oh my god, it's exhausting. These people are exhausting. Hit the like button if you agree that they're exhausting, and also super creepy for some reason. Yeah, they claim to like freedom of speech, but they're gonna go through and censor everything. They're gonna go through, yeah, it just like, um, I don't remember what the, what is the office called that the guy works in in 1984, but yeah, they're like, we're literally going to go through and delete all these phrases we don't like. We're gonna, we're just going to erase them. Loki, that was kind of boring. Banality of evil moment. Yeah, it's like, and it's the same that I've been combating for, you know, years and years and years, even before I started streaming on a full-time basis, like this was, these are not new arguments. Climate change isn't real. Abortion is bad. The only new thing is that they've picked up the whole, like, transgenders are bad. That's, you know, the only new aspect of this, for sure. Freedom of speech is for them to say whatever they want and everyone to agree with them. Yes, exactly. Ministry of Truth. Yes, the Ministry of Truth. Thank you, Jonathan. Free speech exclusivists. That's an excellent term. Free speech is exclusive to them and them alone. Only them. Yeah, we're conquering the monsters in Uncle Sam's attic. What insane... God, thank you for sitting through that with me, everybody. I think I'm done, though. Anyone else talking is a violation of my free speech. True. True. That, you know, I think that's a fair statement. The trans attacks are just the old school anti-homosexual attacks repackaged. It's always the same zombie ideas, all proven useless and incorrect over and over. I guess that's fair. Yeah, they, they think it's probably unpopular, especially after you had folks like, was it John McCain who was like, my daughter's a lesbian and I'm going to support gays or something? Um... Yeah, like it's gauche nowadays to be anti-gay, but they can just repackage it and talk about um, the transes. Dick Cheney, it was Dick Cheney's daughter. Okay. Thank you so much to all my patrons, but especially Tiago Nascimento, Mersh Rovog, Jack, Amanda B, Michelle Frateroli, Michelle Winter, Wellington Marcus, Danielle McDonald, DZXN, LV Nobody, Pastel Infinity, Suzanne Maynard, Nova, Desi Quiche, Celeste, Athiette, Jamie Jam, Sojo, Bean, 
Kevin Young, Mr. Atheist, Liam Hodgson, Elizabeth Bartell, and Jericho.